Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, your host here on Last Week in the Church, the show where we harvest the fruits of the last week's journalistic labors on the Vatican and Global Church beat and, you know, sort of raid the fridge, warm it all up, and serve it up piping hot and delicious. Here's what we've got for you. We'll begin with Secret Agent Man, Pope Francis's secret peace mission in Ukraine, so secret that no one other than he seems to actually know what it consists of, continues to generate both skepticism and anticipation in roughly equal measure. We'll explain what's going on there. Secondly, God save the king. The coronation this weekend of King Charles III and Queen Consort Camilla marked a historical turning point in Catholic-Anglican relations, the first time since the Reformation that the Vatican had a delegation for the enthronement of a British monarch. For popes, both future and present, Saturday's event was also a remembrance of things past. We'll explain why. Third, what we have up for you this week is ancient and new, a very modern papal contender, Cardinal Mayo, Matteo Zuppi of Bologna, uses a very ancient Roman reference to unpack his position on abortion. We'll explain what he said and why it matters. Fourth, we've got vacillating on the Vatican girl. What once seemed a complete slam dunk that the Italian parliament was going to launch its own investigation of the infamous Vatican girl mystery story. Now seems less so because of a stall in the Italian Senate having to do with perceived offense to the memory of St. Pope John Paul II. We'll explain what's going on there. And then finally this week, the agony and the ecstasy. There was a burst of religious fervor in Italy this past week concentrated on the southern Italian city of Naples. Now, ostensibly, it had nothing to do with the Catholic Church, but ladies and gentlemen, this is Italy, which means that in reality, it had everything to do with the Catholic Church. All that and more is waiting for you on this week's edition of Last Week in the Church. So please, for the love of God and all that is holy, stay where you are. Welcome back, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, May 9th, in the year of our Lord, 2023. Before diving into the news this week, I've got a few shout-outs I want to deliver. First, as mentioned, today is May 9th, which, unless my math is horribly wrong, suggests that tomorrow is May 10th. And the significance of May 10th is that it is the birthday of my wife, the love of my life, Elise Ann Allen, who is actually recording this show. She's our camera woman for today. So at least smile and wave to the nice people, even though they can't see you. She's doing it, folks. So wish her buon compleanno, as we say here in Italy, a happy birthday from wherever you are. Second, Elise and I had the opportunity to hang out with a couple of regular viewers of this program this past week. A friend of ours by the name of Father Richie Carlino from the Diocese of Albany, Schenectady to be precise was in town, and so we had the opportunity to take him to the new Vatican Mall. It's called Caput Mundi, the capital of the world. We've talked about it on this show before, but we actually hadn't been there. Very nice, I have to say. Did a nice job with it. Anyway, it was fun hanging out with Father Richie. Later in the week, we met a couple by the name of Gilbert Marsh and his wife Moira. Gilbert is also a regular viewer of this program, recently wrote in with some constructive criticism of my sartorial choices. So Gilbert, all I can say to you is it was great getting to know you, and I hope this sports jacket is to your liking. So to all of you who are regular viewers of the show, good on you. And please know anytime you are in Rome, you've got a home away from home in Rome with us. All right, we begin this week with Secret Agent Man. You will remember last week, we talked about how the Pope, on his way home from Hungary during his customary in-flight news conference, announced a secret peace, I don't know what to say, mission, initiative, effort, undertaking, foray. I mean, I don't know what noun to use to describe this. Basically, what Francis said is that we've got something cooking with regard to the conflict in Ukraine, but it's not public yet. And when it's public, I will tell you. Now, just to follow the bouncing ball, that immediately triggered, I guess you would call them disavowals, 
from both of the interested parties in this conflict, that is the Ukrainians and the Russians. A spokesperson for the Ukrainian government told CNN and other media outlets that we have no idea what the Pope is talking about. If there is something going on, we don't know about it. In a similar vein, a spokesperson for the Russian government told TASS, the, the Russian news agency, that we have no information about any peace initiative. Now, the next thing that happened is that Stefano Zamani, who was a noted Italian economist and until very recently the president of the Pontifical Academy for Social Sciences, announced, no, wait a minute, there actually is a papal peace initiative. He said, back in September, we put together a seven-point peace plan for Ukraine. Now, what makes that interesting is that just a month and a half ago, Pope Francis, in late March, gave an interview to La Nacion, a friend and colleague of ours, a journalist by the name of Beda Piquet, who asked him, does the Vatican have a peace plan for Ukraine? To which his answer was, no, we don't have any plan. He said, we've got a service for peace, but there's no plan. So, again, very unclear. And then the last thing that happened was Cardinal Pietro Parolin, the Vatican Secretary of State, therefore the Pope's top diplomat, said, yeah, you know, we've got a, a mission regarding Ukraine. I'm not sure why the Ukrainians and Russians are saying they don't know about it. He said, maybe this is just a bureaucratic thing, you know, breakdown in communications. But in any event, something is going on. Asked what that something is? Oh, no, no, no. I can't tell you that. That's up to the Pope. When he wants to reveal something, he will. Okay, bottom line. This initiative, assuming there is one, has generated considerable skepticism for a couple of reasons. One is, as I say, just the lack of detail and then in the incoherence about the whole thing. For instance, is there a Vatican peace plan or not? We've got a former Vatican official saying, yes, I wrote it. On the Pope's behalf, we've got the Pope himself saying, no, we have no such plan. You know, asked to provide details about what this initiative might consist of. People are either saying, I don't know, or I can't tell you. And so given all of that, it is understandable why some people are a little bit leery, right? The other reason, just for a basic skepticism, is that this is the Pope of Rome we're talking about, attempting to mediate a conflict between two historically orthodox nations, that is, Russia and Ukraine, both where Eastern Orthodoxy is the dominant uh, religious tradition. And of course, for many Eastern Orthodox, the Pope is not just not one of them, right? But like a deep inbred hostility to the papacy is in some ways part of religious and national identity. So the idea that a bishop of Rome, a pope of Rome, could sort of make a wave a magic wand and make all that go away, you understand why there are a lot of people who just sort of wonder if this is sound and fury signifying nothing. Only thing I would say to all of that is that before you dismiss the idea that the pope could play a constructive role here, I would just point out that not only is it possible, it has actually happened before. You know, the late Cardinal George of Chicago always said that in the Catholic Church, everything has happened at least once. Well, here's a case in point. In the 16th century, Russia, under Ivan the Terrible, a guy who, you know, has had a public reputation not dissimilar from that of Vladimir Putin today, Russia, under Ivan the Terrible, invaded what would today be Latvia and Estonia. It was then known as Livonia. This triggered a war with Sweden and Poland. This war drug on for a quarter century until finally Pope Gregory VII intervened and he sent a Jesuit emissary who negotiated a peace treaty and essentially brought the war to an end. So, question, is it possible that when Russia, under an authoritarian strongman, invades another Central European state, triggering a wider war, is it possible that the Pope of Rome could play a constructive role in mediating an end to that conflict, my answer is, not only is it possible, there's precedent for it. Now, is that going to happen again this time? Who knows? But my point is, look, I understand the case for question marks about all of this, but I just wouldn't prematurely uh, write this off conceptually. You know, as ever, we will see. All right, second up this week, God save the king. So, you know, like many of you, I'm sure, Elise and I watched the coronation ceremony in Great Britain on Saturday. Great pageantry and, in many ways, a sort of moving synthesis, right, 
of centuries of history and symbolism and so on. As Vaticanisti, as journalists who cover the Vatican and the Catholic Church, it was also of news interest because of the presence of Cardinal Paterlin, the Vatican Secretary of State, the number two person in the Roman Catholic power structure, who was on hand along with Cardinal Vincent Nichols, the Archbishop of Westminster, Roman Catholic, to participate in this ceremony. And Cardinal Nichols was actually one of the clergy who delivered a blessing to the new king. All of this, the first time since the Reformation, that Catholics and Anglicans sort of joined forces for the crowning of a new British monarch. Now, the Catholic in me could not help watching all of this play out, but flash back to when this wasn't, coronations weren't just a British thing, they were also a Catholic thing. You know, we'll of course remember that for centuries, popes were crowned. I mean, the beginning of a papacy, formally speaking, was the coronation of the new pope, when popes would receive the tiara, that's that three-leveled crown, which according at least to some interpretations, represented the threefold muni or offices of the papacy, teaching, sanctifying, and governing. The last time a pope received the tiara in a coronation ceremony was on June 30th, 1963. It was Pope, now Saint Paul VI, which means the 60th anniversary of the last papal coronation is coming up this June, on June 30th. Footnote, the cardinal who put the crown on Pope Paul's head that day was Italian Cardinal Alfredo Ottaviani, who at the time was the head of what became the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the Vatican's doctrinal watchdog. He was the leader of the conservative opposition at the Second Vatican Council. So traditional was Ottaviani that the joke goes that once during Vatican II, Ottaviani was across town and he hailed a cab to get back to the Vatican. He got into the back seat of the cab and told the cab driver, take me to the council. The cab driver looked in the rear view mirror and noticed it was Ottaviani, and so he drove him to Trent, right? The council 500 years before Vatican II, because the perception is that's where Ottaviani's head and mind was, and his heart as well. In any event, you know, Pope Paul VI, of course, famously a couple of years later, renounced the tiara, and no pope since has been crowned. I think the great irony here, if you compare the Vatican with the British monarchy, is that while British monarchs have kept the crown, they have largely surrendered most of their real power, right? I mean, the British king or queen is a constitutional monarch who has no real control over policy. On the other hand, popes may have given up the crown, but for the most part, they have kept their power. A pope is still a temporal sovereign. I mean, we always say, you know, the popes lost their temporal power when they lost the papal states. No, they didn't. They lost territory, not power. And if you don't believe popes are still secular monarchs, go talk to the 10 people who are currently on trial for financial crime in front of the Pope's civil tribunal, right? And ecclesiastically, the pope is still, you know, according to canon law, full, supreme, universal, and ordinary jurisdiction in the Catholic Church, which it can exercise unhindered, right? That's what the code says. And so there is this irony that, that the more you tenaciously try to cling to a symbol of your power, the less real power you may actually enjoy. All right, third up this week, so ancient and so new. So if you were to take a poll of professional, what, Vatican watchers, Vaticanisti, Vaticanologists, I don't know, pundits, church junkies, weirdos, whatever, people who pay attention to the papal sweepstakes, and you were to ask them, Give me your top five contenders to be the next pope after Francis. I would bet good money that on most of those lists, the name of Cardinal Matteo Zuppi of Bologna would figure very prominently. Cardinal Zuppi is a product of the community of Sant'Egidio, one of the new movements in the Catholic Church after Vatican II, known for its commitment to humanism, interfaith dialogue, and conflict resolution. Read, it's kind of progressive in orientation. He would be seen as a great friend and ally of Pope Francis. He is also president of the very powerful Italian Bishops' Conference, or CHE. So for all kinds of reasons, Cardinal Zuppi is a big deal. And therefore, it's worth asking, you know, if he were to get a serious look 
as pope, what kind of pope would he be? Well, he said some things in recent days regarding abortion that are quite revealing in that regard. He was taking part in a public festival organized by the Italian newspaper Domani, which is a kind of left of center progressive newspaper. And they were celebrating the anniversary of their foundation. Zuppi agreed to sit on stage and be interviewed by the editor in chief of the newspaper. At one point, the editor in chief asked him a question about surrogate motherhood. This is a big issue in Italy right now because surrogate motherhood is illegal in Italy, but it is legal in many other European states. So a lot of Italian couples, particularly gay couples, will go abroad if they want to try to have a child in that way. The current conservative government in Italy is considering passing a law to make it illegal to go abroad to do that. So it's a sort of hot button issue right now. Zuppi, in his answer, broadened it out to sort of talk about the culture wars in general. And he gave the example of the Italian law on abortion, which is known here as La Legge 194, Law 194, which was adopted in 1978. Basically, it legalizes abortion and within the, the first trimester, the first 90 days of pregnancy, has significant limits for it beyond that point, except in cases of direct threats to the life of the mother and so on. So basically a liberalized but restricted permission for abortion. That was subject to two national referenda in 1981. One wanted to outlaw abortion entirely. One wanted to liberalize it even further. Both of those referenda went down in flames. Overwhelming majorities re rejected both ever since. That is, since 1981, the consensus has been that Law 194 which allows abortion but restricts it, represents basically a social consensus. And that is essentially what Zuppi said in this platform. He said that he called the abortion law a painful law, but says it represents an important secular consensus that no one today wants to call into question. And then he said, when pressed about that, said, we have to get out of thinking in terms of the horati equitiati. Now, I know if you're a non-Roman, you're probably asking yourself right now, what? And I will confess to you that I had some vague sense of those terms, but I actually had to look it up, and I've lived here almost 25 years. The, the Italian for this is the horati equitiati. Basically, it's a reference to an ancient Roman legend set in the time of the ancient Roman kings, right? So before the Republic. The idea is that one time the Romans and the resident, the Albans, the residents of the area around Lake Albano where Castel Gandolfo is, they were having problems, but they didn't want to go to war because they were worried that if they did, then the Etruscans would swoop in and kill them both. So instead, they decided to settle their conflict by having three fighters, that is three Romans and three Albans, fight to the death. And whoever won, you know, that side would win. The Horati brothers fought for Rome. The Curiati brothers fought for the Albans. In the end, Publius, the last surviving of the Horati brothers, the Romans, prevailed. Okay? So the Horati and Curiati has become a metaphor for us versus them thinking with this aspect of a fight to the death. Right? And Zuppi was basically saying we need to get past that. Translation, what are you saying? Is that in his version of the Catholic Church, the kind of church he, would, he wants to lead in Italy and that he would lead as Pope, is no longer going to fight the culture wars. We're not going to fight on principle over whether abortion and things like that ought to be legal. Instead, we're going to work on trying to create cultural conditions under which people would make the free choice, not compelled by the law, not to do those things. Now, some would see that as a very sage, strategic realignment of the church's priorities. Other will see it as a kind of supine surrender to a culture of death. But however you slice it, Zuppi, this very modern papal contender, his invocation of this ancient Roman metaphor gives you a very clear indication of the kind of much more dialogic church that he would like to lead one that is no longer fighting at the legislative and political level over the life issues, but in terms of trying to capture hearts and minds. Interesting, whatever one makes of it. Fourth up this week, vacillating on the Vatican girl. So we've talked a lot on this show about the Vatican girl mystery. This is the 1983 disappearance 
of a 15-year-old girl by the name of Emanuela Orlandi, whose father was a minor official in the prefecture of the papal household. The family had an apartment in Vatican grounds. And so in the 40 years since her disappearance, it is forever and a day been linked in conspiracy theories and kind of the fevered imaginations of lots of people to the Vatican, whether it had to do with geopolitics and John Paul's attempt to bring down communism or the Vatican Bank and the Roman mob or pedophilia and sex abuse, who knows, but it has been a constant subject of speculation. Now, this recently, of course, Netflix did a four-part series called Vatican Girl on the case, which created renewed interest. The Vatican has opened its own investigation, and it seemed for all the world up until very recently, that the Italian parliament was about to do the same thing. The lower house of parliament, the chamber of deputies, voted overwhelmingly to do so several months ago, and it seemed it was going to pass virtually unanimously in the Senate as well, until, until recently, as we have discussed on this show, the brother of the disappeared girl, a Roman by the name of Pietro Orlandi, went on Italian TV to point an accusing finger at the late Pope John Paul II. He played an audio recording of an ex-Roman mobster suggesting that there had been a pedophile ring in the Vatican in which John Paul connived and that Emanuela Orlandi and other young women may have been killed to cover it up. Pietro Orlandi added that he had been told that John Paul used to go out at night with a couple of Polish monsignors and, in his words, it wasn't to bless houses. That set off a furor. We've talked about that. So a leading member of the Italian Senate, former Prime Minister Matteo Renzi, has therefore announced he will no longer support the idea of creating this commission, sort of in protest of Orlandi's, you know, calling into question John Paul's moral integrity and his legacy. Another senator, an ally of Renzi, has taken her name off as a sponsor of this measure. This Wednesday, May 10th, my wife's birthday, is the deadline in the Italian Senate for people to present proposed amendments. And we should know then if this thing, there are really three possibilities. One, it will go through more or less as planned. Two, it will be amended in some fashion, in which case it'll have to go back to the House and who knows what'll happen. Or three, it will just die a natural death. We should know by May 10th. But the irony here may be that while the Vatican investigation is going ahead, the Italian parliamentary investigation isn't, which, you know, to bring us back to the coronation may illustrate why in some ways it's good to be the king. You know, when you're the Pope, you can just say, we're doing this. You don't have to worry about getting people's votes or anything like that. All right, finally this week, the agony and the ecstasy. So I'm gonna talk for just a minute about Italian soccer, okay? And I've done this before, and I know every time I do, Somebody out there is going to send me a note saying, would you please shut up about this? We don't care. And I get it. Like before I lived in Rome, I didn't pay a lot of attention to Italian soccer either. But let me just say this. The Vatican, for all of its pretense of being a global institution, is inextricably, ineradicably, unalterably, genetically an Italian operation. And if you want to understand what shapes the hearts and minds of Vatican officials, you need to know a little something about what's going on in Italy. So apologies, but this context is important. So this past week, the soccer team of Naples, Napoli, won the Italian soccer championship this year. It's the first time they've won since 1990, and it's only their third championship, what the Italians call a Scudetto, in almost 100 years of history. They won in 1987 and 1990, and now finally again in 2023. This has triggered paroxysms of basically religious ecstasy in Naples and all across Southern Italy. Here's why this is in some ways a Catholic story. There is a very strong North-South divide in Italy. In some ways, it parallels the historical divide between North and South in the United States, only it is much worse Because while the southern United States have developed significantly since the era of the Civil War, the Italian South still lags behind in many important respects. I mean, just to give you one small example, there's one Italian region in the north, Lombardy, where Milan is located. It has as many railway miles, tracks, miles of railway tracks, 
as all seven regions of the Italian South combined, right? That's an index of how the North has been favored and the South marginalized by the Italian government since unification in 1861. Naples is the only Southern and Italian team ever to win a championship, and this is only their third, which means the other 90 plus Italian soccer championships have all been won by teams from the North. So for Neapolitans, residents of Naples, this isn't just a sports victory. This is a cultural, political, and yes, spiritual victory. And the devotion they have shown to their team has eerie and remarkable parallels to popular Catholic devotion all across the Italian South. I mean, before the game between Naples and Udine, in which Naples won, I would guarantee you, I didn't do a poll, but I am willing to bet real money that a significant swath of the population all across southern Italy was in front of shrines, sanctuaries, and statues of the Madonna, St. Anthony of Padua, Padre Pio, the other sort of, you know, megastars of the galaxy of popular Italian devotion, praying for their squad. In other words, for them, this win, again, it wasn't just something that happened on the pitch. It was something that happened scripted from heaven. It was an act of divine justice. And the fervor and the joy that they are expressing is spiritual and religious in tone. It has also reminded many people, including a lot of movers and shakers in the Vatican, that there remain significant inequities, developmental, social, cultural, economic inequities in Il Bel Paese. Wouldn't be a great surprise to me if that becomes one of the social and political priorities of the Francis Papacy going forward, who, by the way, is a little bit of a soccer fan himself, and therefore he knows what I'm talking about. All right, that is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all of these stories on the correct site. Again, that is cruxnow.com, cruxnow.com. We will be back here next week, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy. Remember on Wednesday, give a shout out for my wife's birthday. And also, if you have a mind, Elise and I have a very dear friend who is sick right now. I can't say any more than that because it's really his story to tell, not mine. But somebody who's very near and dear to our hearts. If you can slot him in to your prayers and your best wishes, we would be very grateful. We will see you next week. Be well, be good. Keep watching Last Week in the Church.